Take your seats, everyone. Jack and I walked right behind a couple of sixth graders into a building and then followed them to the auditorium. Mrs. G was at the entrance, handing out the programs and telling kids where to go. Fifth graders, down the aisle to the left, she said. Sixth graders, go to the right. Everyone come in, come in. Good morning, go to your staging areas. Fifth graders to the left, sixth graders to the right. The auditorium was huge inside. Big sparkly chandeliers, red velvet walls, rows and rows and rows of cushioned seats leading up to the giant stage. We walked down the wide aisle and followed the signs to the fifth grade staging area, which was in a big room to the left of the stage. Inside were four rows of folding chairs facing the front of the room, which is where Miss Rubin was standing, waving us in as soon as we walked in the room. Okay, kids, take your seats, take your seats, she was saying, pointing to the rows of chairs. Don't forget you're sitting alphabetically. Come on, everybody, take your seats. Not too many kids had arrived yet, though, and the ones who had weren't listening to her. Me and Jack were sword fighting with our rolled up programs. Hey, guys, it was Summer walking over to us. She was wearing a light pink dress and I think a little makeup. Wow, Summer, you look awesome, I told her, because she really did. Really thinks you do too, Augie. Yeah, you look okay, Summer said Jack behind Jack kind of matter of factly. And for the first time, I realized that Jack had a crush on her. This is so exciting, isn't it, said Summer? Yeah, kind of, I answered, nodding. Oh man, look at this program, said Jack, scratching his forehead. We're going to be here all freaking day. I looked at my program. Headmaster's opening remarks, Dr. Harold Jansen. Middle school director's address, Mr. Lawrence Tushman. Light and day, middle school choir. Fifth grade student commencement address, Exim Chin. Pachabel Cannon and D, middle school chamber music ensemble. Sixth grade student commencement address, Mark Atonic. Under pressure, middle school choir, middle school dean's address, Ms. Jennifer Rubin, awards presentation, see back. Roll call of names. Why do you think that, I asked? Because Mr. Jansen's speech is gone forever, said Jack. He's even worse than Mr. Tushman. My mom said she actually dozed off when she spoke last, when he spoke last year, Summer Adam. What's the awards presentation, I asked. That's where they give medals to the biggest brainiacs, Jack answered which would mean Charlotte and Eximna will win everything in the fifth grade, just like Charlotte in the fourth grade and in the third grade. Not in second grade, I left. They didn't give those awards out in second grade, he answered. Maybe you'll win this year, I joked. Not unless they give awards for the most C's, he laughed. Everybody take your seats, Miss Rubin started yelling louder now, like she was getting annoyed that nobody was listening. We have a lot to get through, so take your seats. Don't forget, you're sitting in alphabetical order. A through G is the first row, H through N is the second row, O through Q is the third row, R through Z is the last row. Let's go, people. We should go sit down, said Summer, walking toward the front section. You guys are definitely coming over to my house after this, right? I called out after her. Definitely, she said, taking her seat next to Exim Nichin. When did Summer get so hot, Jack muttered in my ear. Shut up, dude, I said, laughing as we headed toward the third row. Seriously, when did that happen, he whispered. Taking the seat next to mine, Mr. Will, Miss Rubin shouted. Last time I checked, W came between R and Z, yes? Jack looked at her blankly. Dude, you're in the wrong row, I said. I am. The face he made as he got up to leave, which was a mixture of looking completely confused and looking like he'd just played a joke on someone totally cracked me up. A simple thing. About an hour later, we were all seated in the giant auditorium waiting for Mr. Tushman to, be, to give his middle school address. The auditorium was even bigger than I imagined it would be, bigger even than the one in, at Via School. I looked around and there must have been a million people in the audience. Okay, maybe not a million, but definitely a lot. Thank you, Headmaster Jansen, for those very kind words of introduction, said Mr. Tushman, standing behind the podium on the stage. He, was talk he talked into the microphone. Welcome, my fellow teachers and members of the faculty. Welcome, parents and grandparents, friends and honored guests, and most especially, welcome to my fifth and sixth grade students. Welcome to Beecher Prep Middle School Graduation Ceremonies. Everyone applauded. Every year, continued Mr. Tushman reading from his notes with his reading glasses way down on the tip of his nose. I am charged with writing two commencement addresses, one for fifth and one sixth grade graduation ceremony today and one for the seventh and eighth grade ceremony that will take place tomorrow. And every year I say to myself, let me cut down on my work and write just one address that I can use for both situations. Seems like it shouldn't be such a hard thing to do, right? And yet each year, I still end up with two different speeches, no matter what my intentions, and I finally figured out why this year. 
It's not as you might assume simply because tomorrow I'll be talking to an older crowd with the middle school experience that is largely behind them, whereas your middle school experience is, is largely in front of you. No, I think it has to do more with this particular age that you are right now. This particular moment in your lives that even after 20 years of my being around students this age still moves me because you're at the cusp. Kids, you're at the edge between childhood and everything that comes after. You're in transition. We are all gathered here today, Mr. Tushman continued, taking off his glasses and using them to point at all of us in the audience, all your families, friends, teachers, to celebrate not only your achievements of this past year, future middle schoolers, but your endless possibilities. When you reflect on this past year, I want you all to look at where you are now and where you've been. You've all gotten a little taller, a little stronger, a little smarter, I hope. Here, some people in the audience chuckled, but the best way to measure how much you've grown isn't by inches or the number of laps you can now run or on the track or even your grade point average, though those things are important to be sure. It's what you've done with your time, how you've chosen to spend your days and whom you've had, you've had, you've touched this year. That to me is the greatest measure of success. There's a wonderful line in a book by J.M. Barry, and no, it's not Peter Pan, and I'm not going to ask you to clap if you believe in fairies. Here, everyone laughed again. But in another book by J.M. Barry called The Little White Bird, he writes, he started flipping through a small book on the podium until he found the page he was looking for, and then he put on his reading glasses. Shall we make a new rule of life always to try to be a little kinder than is necessary? Here, Mr. Tushman looked up at the audience, kinder than is necessary, he repeated. What a marvelous line, isn't it? Kinder than is necessary. Because it's not enough to be kind. One should be kinder than needed. Why I love that line. That concept is that it reminds me that we carry with us as human beings, not just the capacity to be kind, but the very choice of kindness. And what does that mean? How is that measured? You can't use a yardstick. It's like I was saying just before, it's not like measuring how much you've grown in, the year, in a year. It's not exactly quantifiable, is it? How do we know we've, we've been kind? What is being kind anyway? He put on his reading glasses again and started flipping through another book, small book. There's another passage in a different book I'd like to share with you, he said, if you'll bear with me while I find it. Ah, here we go. In Under the Eye of the Clock by Christopher Nolan, the main character is a young man who's facing some extraordinary challenges. There's this one part where someone helps him, a kid in his class. On the surface, it's a small gesture, but this young man, whose name is Joseph, it's, well, if you'll permit me. He glared his throat and read from the book. It was at moments such as these that Joseph recognized the face of God in human form. It glimmered in their kindness to him. It glowed in their kind keenness. It hinted in their caring. Indeed, it caressed in their gaze. He paused and took off his reading glasses again. It glimmered in their kindness to him, he repeated, smiling. Such a simple thing, kindness. Such a simple thing, a nice word of encouragement given when needed, an act of friendship, a passing smile. He closed the book, put it down, and leaned forward on the podium. Children, what I want to impart to you today is an understanding of the value of that simple thing called kindness. And that's all I want to leave you with today. I know I'm kind of infamous for my um, verbosity. Here, everybody laughed again. I guess he knew he was known for his long speeches. But what I want you, my students, to take away from your middle school experience, he continued, is the sure knowledge that in the future you make for yourselves, anything is possible if every single person in this room made it a rule that wherever you are, whatever you can, you will try to act a little kinder than is necessary. The world really would be a better place. And if you do this, if you act just a little kinder than is necessary, someone else somewhere someday may recognize in you, in every single one of you, the face of God. He paused and shrugged, or whatever politically correct spiritual representation of universal goodness you happen to believe in, he added quickly smiling, which got a lot of laughs and loads of applause, especially from the back of the auditorium where the parents were sitting. Awards. I liked Mr. Tishman's speech, but I have to admit I kind of zoned out a little during some of the other speeches. I turned in again as Miss Rubin started reading off the names of the kids who'd made the honor the high honor roll, because we were supposed to stand up when our names are, were called, so I waited and listened for my name's name as she went down the list alphabetically. Reed Kingsley, Maya Markowitz, August Pullman. I stood up, then when she finished reading out the name, she asked us all to face the audience and take a bow, and everyone applauded. 
I had no idea where in that huge crowd my parents might be sitting. All I could see were the flashes of light from people taking photos and parents waving at their kids. I pictured mom waving at me from somewhere even though I couldn't see her. Then Mr. Tushman came back to the podium to present the medals for academic excellence and Jack was right. Examina Chin won the gold medal for overall academic excellence in the fifth grade. Charlotte won the silver. Charlotte also won a gold medal medal for music. Amos won a medal for overall excellence in sports, which I was really happy about because ever since the nature retreat, I consider Amos to be like one of my best friends in school. But I was really, really thrilled when Mr. Tushman called out Summer's name for the gold medal in creative writing. I saw Summer put her hand over her mouth when her name was called, and when she walked up into, onto the stage, I yelled, woohoo, Summer, as loudly as I could, though I don't think she heard me. After the last name was called, all the kids who just won awards stood next to each other on stage, and Mr. Tishman said to the audience, Ladies and gentlemen, I am very honored to present to you this year's Beecher Prep School Scholastic Achievers. Congratulations to all of you. I applauded as the kids on stage bowed. I was so happy for summer. The final award this morning, said Mr. Tishman, after the kids on stage had returned to their seats is the Henry Ward Beecher Medal to honor students who have been notable or exemplary in certain areas throughout the school year. Typically, this medal has been our way of acknowledging volunteerism or service to the school. I immediately figured Charlotte would get this medal because she organized the goat drive this year, so I kind of zoned out a bit again. I looked at my watch, 1056. I was getting hungry for lunch already. Henry Ward Beecher was, of course, the 19th century abolitionist and fiery sermon sermonizer for human rights after whom this school was named. Mr. Tushman was saying when I started paying attention again. While reading up on his life in preparation for this award, I came upon a passage that he wrote that seemed particularly consistent with the themes I touched on earlier, themes I've been ruminating upon all year long. Not just the nature of kindness, but the nature of one's kindness, the power of one's friendship, the test of one's character, the strengths of one's courage. And here the weirdest thing happened, Mr. Tushman's voice cracked a bit, like he got all choked up. He actually cleared his throat and took a big sip of water. I started paying attention for real now to, to what he was saying. The strength of one's courage, he repeated quietly, nodding and smiling. He held up his right hand like he was counting off. Courage, kindness, friendship, character, these are all the qualities that define us as human beings and propel us on occasion to greatness. And this is what the Henry Ward Beecher Medal is about, recognizing greatness. But how do we do that? How do we measure something like greatness? Again, there's no yardstick for that kind of thing. How do we even define it? Well, Beecher actually had an answer for that. He put his reading glasses on again, leafed through a book and started to read. Greatness wrote Beecher, lies not in being strong, but in the right using of strength. He is the greatest whose strength carries up the most hearts. And again, out of the blue, he got all choked up. He put his two index fingers over his mouth for a second before continuing. He is the greatest, he finally continued, whose strength carries up the most hearts by the attraction of his own. Without further ado, this year I am very proud to award the Henry Ward Beecher Medal to the student whose quiet, quiet strength has carried up the most hearts. So will August Pullman please come up here to receive this award.